une communauté, un groupe sous-représenté, ils vont nous parler, et ils vont parler des frontières internes, en quelque sorte, auxquelles ils font face, des obstacles dans leur fonction, et aussi euh, des, euh, des frontières qu'on a intériorisées, des obstacles qu'on a intériorisés, et de ce qu'ils font pour les contourner et euh, les, euh, les surmonter. Et euh, donc je vais vous les présenter le, et présenter le modérateur enfin, de, de la table ronde. Alors le modérateur sera euh, le président ancien, ce sera docteur Gary Warner, notre ancien directeur, euh, directeur de Arts and, du programme Arts and Science, ancien, sortant, euh, et puis euh, qui a or, obtenu l'ordre du Canada et aussi euh, le président sortant de Hamilton Community Foundation, très très impliqué dans, euh, la, dans Hamilton et la région. Ensuite, je vais présenter euh, Madame Inès Rios, qui est euh, directrice de Immigrant Women Center et qui est aussi une artiste, euh, social media artiste, et puis elle publie, vous pourrez regarder euh, Women Press, qui est un journal très intéressant sur la situation des femmes migrantes dans la région, les nouvelles. Ensuite, Mme Maroufa Shimwari, qui est directrice de Hamilton Culture and Art Association, qui était professeure de droit à l'Université de Kaboul et qui est aussi une artiste de sculpte. Euh, et ensuite, je vais présenter M. Saïd Ben, qui est directeur de, du théâtre francophone Atelier 83. Euh, L'année dernière, j'ai invité sa, son, sa troupe à euh, jouer euh, pour euh, les étudiants, euh, Mac Master, et pour les, 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 étudiants de, les élèves de lycée, nos étudiants, euh, ont une très bonne prestation. Ensuite, euh, je vous euh, présente Deidre, euh, Madame Deidre Pike, qui est euh, senior euh, policy, non, est senior euh, à, enfin, chercheuse. Euh, de euh, comment c'est Social Planning and Research Council dans ses recherches et activismes dans le domaine de la pauvreté à Hamilton et euh, aussi représentante des euh, communautés euh, queer, queer. <rire> voilà euh, et puis euh, elle, elle écrit aussi des articles pour le journal local de Spectator des articles que je lis euh, religieusement euh, façon de parler euh, <rire> So the panel will uh, take place in English and in French, mostly in English because our representatives are we live in Ontario and we're all English speaking or pretend to be, at least I am. And uh, except for Mr. Saint Ben, will be speaking in French, and Gary has a choice of uh, uh, languages. So la parole est à tout le monde. So you. So each person will speak for 10 minutes et puis, on va interagir avec eux. Merci, Mme Et puis, on va suivre l'ordre dans lequel les membres de la table ronde sont assis. Donc, nous allons suivre l'ordre dans lequel les gens sont assis. Donc, so, in answer, nous allons aller straight but without further introduction. Thank you. Uh, son las 5 de la tarde et c'est viernes de la tarde. C'est viernes, c'est bien viernes. Después de las 5 de la tarde. Que te parece, Marufa? Uh, ¿Queremos estar aquí? ¿Pero queremos estar aquí o queremos irnos? Uh, Marufa and I have agreed that uh, we are going to talk about beyond culture and beyond language. Um, um, is a class if reflecting on the question what are the walls and what are the obstacles that uh, interfere in the flow of ideas? Um, you know, it's very natural and everybody thinks that it's language and culture, right? But uh, I will only s focus on the aspect of economics and, uh, and how um, the power, uh, the dominant um, governments that um, provide the economics for us to grow or they limit our freedom, uh, stop the flow of ideas and creativity. I will focus more on creativity, right? Which is um, how we um, uh, innovate and how uh, we bring new things that are to keep up with changes in, in society. So uh, the, the, the case that I have here 
is, for example, a wow marla. Okay, marla is a wow marla lives in a in a um, you know middle low uh, socioeconomic uh, neighborhood, and uh, she is um, uh, really busy, and her number one preoccupation is employment. So Marla uh, cannot attend uh, community uh, gatherings. Uh, she was not this morning at, um, at, at the funeral that we had this morning. Uh, she was not last night at the uh, Parent Teacher Association. She was she had a shape, shift um, job. And, uh, uh, and she did not show up at the tenants' uh, uh, engagement uh, thing that we had last week. Okay, so there was a tenants' engagement, and what a bit of money was invested in the tenants' engagement meeting, but Marla couldn't make it. So, what is a risk? What is at stake when Marla, like many others, do not show up and they don't bring their ideas and they don't bring the dumb reality? So the question is for you to answer. <laughs> I, um, you know, what is our risk? So the next uh, um, um, part that I want to connect with that is uh, um, employees, like the one that we work in social services. I have an employee named uh, uh, Nada. Okay, Nada is immersed in paperwork, and she sees about four to six clients a day. And persons like Martha may come and see Nada, and Nada, there's no way she can convince Marla to participate because Nada has no time to get, you know, engaged into these other things that are not funded by the government because she has a job and she has to do this. So at five o'clock, Nada is a woman. So, you know, we add the aspect of gender. Nada has to run home because where she has the children and the, you know there's a lot of other things and layers and layers. So that's another barrier for her to participate. So what is at risk when she doesn't participate and she cannot do more? Right? So the next layer is, um, and it has to do with economics, right? Is uh, um, the work of a social agency social services agents, such as the Immigrant Women's Center. Um, economics drive everything that we do there and limits and constraint and, uh, and have there's very little freedom. Okay? We signed a, um, a contribution agreement, that is to say a contract with the government. And that contract is start in the fiscal year. And the fiscal year starts in April 1st. So our life starts on April 1st, and we cannot do anything else that is different than the contract until March 31st. So it's a static. Okay? So there is no other flow of ideas except for what we have there. We have to, and it's not a complaint, so don't take it as a complaint, we have to give 15 days of notice in advance if we have to if we were to do a press release <laughs> 15 days in advance 40 days for an event and uh, they have they will read and review the text and, and the the context of everything and uh, after that they will give us a check mark and we now press we can flow the press, the press release for something that is already old and no newspaper wanted, right? Yeah. The media doesn't want it. So what is at risk when our life becomes static and there is these constraints, right? What is at risk? It's normally our funding. So we cannot really move too much out of it. Um, with respect to community and what we do, we are in constant editing. That newspaper is edited again and again because there is a lot at risk. And um, I will close with reminding you that Prince Charles has 27 letters in England, you know, the future king, if he can make it, uh, has uh, 27 letters 
or 23, 24, something like that, right? That he cannot make public. And if he was banned by court, that those cannot be public because that his kinship could be is at risk and of you know, being neutral. So, you know, as wonderful our life seems to be because we all carry our blackberries and so on, um, there is much more uh, to it than the barriers of language and culture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And thank you for, for sticking to the time. <laughs> and I think what I will do, um, uh, thank you for drawing attention to the importance of understanding the reality of people's lives as the basis for any actions that are going to take um, um, Maybe I'll allow one question, just one question, <coughs> while it's fresh in people's mind. We'll come back to question period afterwards. What are they? What are they? What are they? What are they? You talked about the they were checking your, your projects or they bureaucrats. Which ones? Who's checking all that? Uh, who's checking? The funders. The people that you know have the funding. The, the, who is the, funding? the financial. In this case, for us, in the federal government. Okay. Thank you. Okay, what I want to do. <laughs> We have to make sure that our national funds are properly uh, used. Oh, our federal government. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> so, Maruf, Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I really appreciate uh, the chance uh, being here and uh, sharing my expertise and experience with you. Um, I just uh, want to continue what Ines, she emphasized uh, in her uh, speech uh, about barriers, but uh, specifically highlight the barriers and the, the boundaries that newcomers and immigrants, especially the group that we are involved with them, artist group and uh, uh, cultural workers they are facing. Barriers are always out for us as human beings, uh, either if you are newcomer or not newcomer, uh, by um, design or default, we have barriers in our life that daily base or in general we are facing. But let's talk about and uh, just imagine if we are a newcomer uh, in a new country. And I'm sure you know, uh, for a group of uh, you that who came from France or Montreal, you understand that you know the pillow that you sleep tonight is not the same that you have uh, or you are sleeping every day, uh, every night. So these are barriers that gives impression of change. And for uh, for newcomers, it takes time, m very much time. So uh, general barriers that newcomers they are facing of um, an instrumental language can be uh, family composition. If it's large family, of course, there is a barrier to move on with your second step, long term, short term plan. And culture shock that they are facing a new society, new community, uh, starting from dress, the way you, um, uh, religion, the way you speak, the way you behave. And the uh, education background that you have, they are all barriers that newcomers that they are facing at the beginning of six, seven months, and after it takes them a while to get in, and uh, we call the settlement and integration. And if they reach the the good chance of having good employee or uh, or job, uh, they are integrated. And if not, so they fall uh, somewhere. But for, for any, any newcomer, there are many barriers. Uh, you know, you can go through many uh, uh, studies that are out there on the internet everywhere. But from, from our perspective, as a worker that they are in daily base working with newcomer, I want to highlight just uh, three, four points that you may not see in, in the box or, or on studies and uh, researches. The first thing that uh, cultural workers uh, they are facing in a new society or new country uh, is documentation, simple documentation. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, an Indian uh, tabla player or musician uh, back home, he doesn't need to go to college and have certificates because the school of his generation, father, grandfather and so on, he learned that and the society accepts acknowledge and recognize his skill. He doesn't need to have the certificate and have a resume and present to um, a child or someone that, uh, in our society. 
and it, this is totally different culture. They are facing, um, uh, you know, they have to present documentation, and there is no documentation at all. To, to make sure that to organize their concerts, there's lack of funding. Government never give any organization funding. Again, we go to government uh, to organize a concert for newcomer artists to express his skill uh, to, the, to the community or, or to the society or reach the viewers. This is barrier. It's something that blocks people to move on with their life in a, in a new society. Uh, interestingly, uh, I had uh, three days ago uh, a very interesting interview with uh, um, artist, amazing artist. She was doing sculpture, so she's French-speaking, uh, very young, talented lady. She came from France. Lack of information is big challenge for many newcomers, <coughs> mainly for for artists. So she never knew about such an organization, and four years it took her to just do volunteering and uh, working with different groups, doing some healing, art session, and so on. But you know, to accomplish as an artist in this westernized um, or, or our society, you have to be uh, well participated in cultural life of the community. And no one has time, efforts, and um, again, you know, resources to do that for you. And again, you know, information, having access to information is a big barrier for, for cultural workers uh, within this society. And the other, very interestingly, uh, our finding or showing is the shift of the uh, first source of income. If you are back home, uh, your cultural worker, your musician, or you are um, doing pottery, um, as an artist, you are well known, and you can survive based on whatever your art comes out. You can you can um, sell your products, uh, and uh, you know you can survive. In 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 the westernized society, mostly in Canada, you cannot survive if you are an artist. Unfortunately, they go right away to poverty. You know, to the to the poorest uh, category of our our society, and to get back to it, they have to cross all these barriers, culture shock and get in to some some chances, you know, um, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, to, to be again a, a successful, well-known artist, to have the first source of income because you're an artist. It's impossible. For some people, it's okay, maybe one out of 100, but many of them, they are going, and, and you know, the culture goes uh, kind of erasing from, from uh, their life. Um, based on our, our interviews that we are doing, and we are empowering many community groups uh, in, in Hamilton, we find so many talent we are losing every day, every month, and every year because of lack of resource, because of lack of information, and because of uh, not having access either to them or they don't have access to, the, to all this resource. So I will stop here, my time is over, but if you have any questions, most welcome. Thank you. So we have someone who is very actively involved in cultural work and sharing uh, the last two years. For the last two years. Yes. And also before that in immigration. Yes, work. yes, I did 14 years. So again we we'll try the same uh, strategy. In question. Mm -hmm. In question present. Mm -hmm. well, uh, what does your organization do to uh, help the artist uh, work? If you can give an example or two. The Immigrant Culture and Art Association for the last 10 years in Hamilton uh, works, and we are the only one in all Canada, uh, works very successfully to recruit uh, artists from Ontario mainly, um, empower them by mentorship program that we have. We make sure that the artists have their, they have their portfolio, artistic portfolio, not only resume, make sure if they are a musician, they have their CD, if they, um, and organize their first concert, we do. We, we try our best uh, through donations and through some operation fund uh, to have their first either concert or exhibition and uh, showcase their artwork. Many many every year, um, uh, more than 20 exhibitions we are uh, organizing. Many places they are giving us free space for that. We have art school, art education program for children and low income um, uh, families. Um, painting, pottery, music, and dance classes this year. 
and uh, any community, ethnic groups, they have celebration, the cultural component of the, uh, their activity will be sponsored by our organization. It's a very small organization, um, hundreds of um, uh, hours of volunteer uh, work, uh, but um, you know, the, our work is, I can say, is strongly 90%, 95% is uh, the outcome is there. So generally we do that. So still staying in the, in the world of art, uh, nous passons à notre présentation en français avec Saïd. Merci de m'offrir cette opportunité de, de placer quelques mots en français. Euh, C'est pas que je, ne, je parle anglais, mais je parle très mal. Alors je ne peux pas écorcher une langue qui est aussi belle que l'anglais. Et puis c'est aussi une occasion de faire résonner, donc quand je l'ai dit, quelques mots en français. Euh, le théâtre de l'atelier 83 a été créé en, il y a trois ans bientôt, avec comme mission de pouvoir un peu remplir partiellement le vide. Euh, que nous avons constaté dans toute la région du centre sud-ouest de l'Ontario. C'était vu par certains comme, un, comme un, une folie, par d'autres comme un défi, pour nous tout simplement euh, une démarche à tenter. Et donc euh, nous avons conçu un, un répertoire artistique qui puisse aller rejoindre les attentes des uns et des autres, même si dans, dans l'absolu, euh, on savait que c'était des pas gagnés d'avance. Et pourquoi Parce que tout simplement, euh, les communautés qui ont le français en partage sont diverses, sont largement dispersées à travers ce territoire qui est quand même très grand, et, et qui ont d'autres préoccupations que de, que de faire ou de revendiquer l'acte culturel comme, 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 comme un besoin. Voilà. Et donc il fallait... Euh, se transformer d'une compagnie de théâtre qui est un projet artistique donc de création en un centre dramatique qui lui a une mission beaucoup plus euh, une fonction sociale qui est de rayonner culturellement par le français et donc euh, nous avons fait euh, nous avons mis au point donc une stratégie pour rejoindre ces publics là euh, des moyens de communication différents et puis euh, nous avons pu quand même rayonner sur euh, sur un territoire de 100 km de rayon, de Toronto jusqu'à jusqu Kitchener, jusqu'à Sainte-Catherine. Et nous avons rencontré une large communauté. Il y, a, il y a juste un point sur lequel je voudrais quand même attirer votre attention. Sur, euh, quand on parle de la communauté franco-ontarienne, elle est, elle est scindée pratiquement en deux grands pôles. Il y a les franco-ontariens de souche, voilà, puis il y a les autres qui sont issus de la diversité culturelle et qui ont le français en partage, ceux-là sont doublement marginalisés. Marginalisés en tant qu'immigrants, donc de par leur statut, nouveaux immigrants, et marginalisés parce qu'ils n'ont pas les mêmes chances d'accès aux produits culturels que les franco-ontariens. Et puis, chose encore plus grande, parce qu'il ne faut pas pratiquer la langue de bois, il n'y a aucune forme de, de, de communication sérieuse, ni de pont d'échange entre les deux communautés. Ça, c'est le premier obstacle. C'est franco-français, on va dire, euh, si, 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 si l'expression est bonne. Ça, c'est le premier obstacle. Le deuxième obstacle, c'est cette façon de, de permettre aux artistes issus de l'immigration, hein, je parle toujours de la diversité francophone, de pouvoir accéder aux mêmes chances de production et de diffusion que les autres. Ça, c'est le deuxième obstacle auquel nous avons fait face. Et c'est pour, pour lequel, d'ailleurs, nous organisons un forum le 10 novembre à Toronto. Faire venir les pouvoirs publics, parce que le premier obstacle, finalement, ce n'est pas le fait de ne pas vouloir s'intégrer. L'intégration, je pense, nourrit chacun des immigrants. C'est un souci permanent. On s'intègre par ses enfants, on s'intègre par le travail, on s'intègre par différents. Mais nous, on pense aussi qu'on s'intègre, et on s'intègre mieux avec la culture, en faisant accepter la différence identitaire à travers sa culture, et donc rompre un petit peu ou, 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 ou éliminer les barrières vers l'autre. Et donc, nous avons pris comme axe de vouloir 
rapprocher les communautés par les arts. Et à un niveau, donc, qui soit... Euh, parce que il y a un aspect sur lequel je ne peux pas passer, c'est le fait que quand les productions, quelles qu'elles soient, aussi différentes et aussi euh, diversifiées soit-elles, sont le produit de ces communautés dites francophones issues de migration, elles sont généralement, généralement poussées vers une forme de communautarisme et donc frappées du saut, du, au sens péjoratif du terme, du folklore, de la curiosité. On ne voyage pas, on ne va pas au Gabon, on ne va pas en Côte d'Ivoire, nous, nous avons la Côte d'Ivoire dans, dans, dans le sous-sol d'une église. Vous voyez On fait des soupers, on fait des linges, c'est très beau, on applaudit, ça ne s'arrête pas. Restez au-delà de la limite qu'on vous a tracée. C'est ça, c'est la réalité. Et tant que les gens n'abordent pas cette réalité, aucun effort, aucun développement ne pourrait être constaté. Alors, notre, notre bataille, ça a été un peu ça. On a touché pratiquement les établissements scolaires, on a touché le milieu ouvrier, on a touché les, les, les milieux les plus, les plus euh, on va dire, classe moyenne, on a touché différents publics pour pouvoir les sensibiliser à la question et attirer l'attention des bailleurs de fonds sur le théâtre de la Tunisie. En trois ans d'existence, après quatre demandes de subvention, on n'en a reçu qu'une seule. Qu'une seule. Le Conseil des Arts de l'Ontario a refusé deux autres. Je m'excuse. On a refusé deux autres. Non, moi je vais encore. Oui, c'est une convention. Vous avez fini Vous avez fini Juste, non, parce qu'il y a des choses qu'il ne faut pas. Jamais de toute façon. Voilà, donc les bailleurs de fonds marginalisent systématiquement. Les artistes et ceux de l'immigration. Systématiquement. Ce n'est pas que les règles ne soient pas claires. Les règles sont claires. L'application des règles ne sont pas claires. Elles obéissent à d'autres réalités, à des enjeux que je ne maîtrise pas et que je ne veux pas en parler. Ce n'est pas l'occasion. D'accord Mais ça, c'est un fait. C'est un autre obstacle de taille. On ne peut pas produire sans les fonds nécessaires et l'appui nécessaire qui sont au fait les droits de ces citoyens immigrants qui payent leurs impôts et qui ont en retour le droit de pouvoir en bénéficier à travers donc, les produits faits par leurs artistes, ce qui est tout à fait normal. Donc, fini le, 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 le discours biaisé des pouvoirs publics. Maintenant, les gens sont de plus en plus conscients. On en parlera lors du forum. C'est un forum provincial. Et fini donc le fait de dire « tout est beau ». Tout est magnifique. Non, non, le Canada est un beau pays, excellent pays, magnifique, Donc, des conditions incroyables. Sauf que quand ça ne va pas quelque part, il faut le dire. Et quels sont nos devoirs Et ça aussi, la part de responsabilité du public, donc de, de, des gens que nous côtoyons, des gens que, qui sont issus d'immigration, c'est d'abord, d'abord, la peur. La peur d'oser. La peur d'entreprendre. La peur de dire les choses. Voilà. Donc, euh, en 10 minutes, je peux passer à toute la question. Vous voyez un petit peu juste euh, la mission à l'instar des produits, quel, auquel, à quel cas de figure nous faisons face. Voilà. Je m'arrête ici pour ne pas trop d'autres. Alors, le thème de la marginalisation, enfin, le manque d'accès, je vois, ça se retrouve dans toute présentation. Une question Any questions Français. Oui. <rire> euh, vous avez parlé de cette rupture, de cette euh, confrontation entre les francophones et les franco-ontariens. Les francophones. Les francophones. Les francophones. Mais du côté, comme on habite au Québec, du côté québécois, on a l'impression que tous les francophones. Oui. On a l'impression que les communautés francophones en général en Ontario euh, se heurtent elles aussi à ce manque de communication, de services, de droits euh, culturels et, et linguistiques 
euh, par rapport à la majorité anglophone. Ce que vous nous dites, c'est que ça va plus loin chez les francophones euh, des communautés dites culturelles. Comment, à travers votre théâtre, arrivez-vous à résoudre cette équation Comment dit, quel type de production avez-vous euh, pour l'instant euh, développé et quel type de public arrivez-vous à euh, lier euh, grâce à ces productions oui, oui. C'est une très bonne question, justement. Nous, nous avons attaqué la question par le biais de l'universalité. La thématique ne pouvait pas être prise selon des critères très précis en fonction peut-être d'une communauté ou d'une autre. Non. Le principe était que la thématique touchait l'homme, quel qu'il soit, non, sur un espace qu'on appelle la Terre. D'accord Tout ce qui est. Il y a des auteurs du répertoire, il y a des auteurs contemporains, il y a des auteurs qu'on a pris. Je ne vais pas m'étendre là-dessus. Mais c'était une thématique qui était ouverte. Jamais dans notre intention, nous n'en avons fait euh, de notre scène euh, un outil de propagande pour une communauté ou une autre. Hein Jamais. Finalement. Alors, c'est ça, donc, euh, ça persiste. Ce pas les bailleurs de fond, en tout cas. Alors, alors c'est ça. Donc, euh, on a été, euh, le théâtre, de manière générale, est généreux dans ses propositions. Le théâtre ne peut pas être sectaire. Nous ne sommes pas sectaires. Donc, c'est juste pour répondre brièvement à cette question-là. Maintenant, par rapport à la problématique au Québec, elle est différente. Là-bas, nous sommes dans un bastion francophone. C'est différent. Là-bas, c'est un problème d'intégration, tout simplement, des immigrants. Qu'ils soient francophones ou, 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 ou allophones, ou voilà. Ce n'est pas pareil. Ici, il y a une double problématique, je l'ai située. Ça veut dire que ici, il y a l'avantage d'être quelquefois en situation minoritaire, d'accord Mais en situation minoritaire, on ne peut pas considérer que les Franco-Ontariens soient en situation minoritaire et on tire des avantages de cette situation-là, hein et puis pousser les autres à être en sous-sous-minorité. Vous voyez ce que je veux dire voilà. Nous avons essayé de créer, des, 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 de proposer des thèmes. Par exemple, dans le mois des mois, nous avons créé le, le, le spectacle Crépuscule qui, lui, s'attaquait à la question de la traite négrière par les Arabes. Jamais sujet n'a été traité par le théâtre. Voilà. Étant moi-même originaire arabe, j'ai pris donc le, 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 le défi de pouvoir dénoncer ça, qui est un, considéré comme un tabou. Tout ça, pourquoi ben, Tout simplement pour créer un débat autour de la question. Ça ne touche pas la communauté franco-ontarienne, la communauté, même les anglophones étaient là, les francophiles, je veux dire. J'ai bien spécifié que notre axe de, de création et de diffusion était très professionnel, très rigoureux par l'éthique, très rigoureux aussi, et conduit justement par des impératifs artistiques, esthétiques et thématiques. Et puis l'autre axe, c'était de pouvoir faire du rayonnement pour sensibiliser. Parce que aussi, il faut le dire, il n'y a pas de rayonnement. Il n'y a pas de rayonnement culturel francophone en tant que terre. Il y a juste des activités très périodiques, ici et là, souvent communautaires, mais il n'y a jamais eu de culture, la culture ne se conjugue francophone, ne se conjugue pas au quotidien. Donc ça, c'est un handicap qui est, on va dire, géographiquement, politiquement, socialement, euh, discutable. Tu vois, mais c'est pas ça. C'est qu'est-ce qu'il y a derrière comme, comme multitude de petits obstacles qui en font de grands obstacles. Voilà, c'est ça qui... Euh, J'espère avoir répondu. Bon. Oh, je peux oui, une dernière. Vous avez dit que vous aviez reçu une subvention sur quatre demandes. Ouais. Est-ce que euh, c'est simplement une arithmétique comme ça, c'est-à-dire euh, voilà, de manière aléatoire, euh, une sur quatre, alors que d'autres seraient deux sur quatre ou trois sur quatre, ou encore moins Ou bien est-ce qu'il y a une raison au projet qui a reçu une subvention d'après vous Est-ce que euh, vous pouvez dé décrypter euh, quelque chose là-dedans Vous vous êtes rapproché de certains critères euh, Absolument. Je comprends la question et, 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 et je suis ravi que vous l'avez posé. C'est qu'on a eu affaire à deux bailleurs de fonds différents. Alors, Trillium, pour ne pas le citer, c'était sur une demande de d'équipement. De, de, Trillium, de par sa façon de fonctionner, est un bailleur de fonds très ouvert. Il a subventionné pratiquement tous nos organismes. On sent. Le Conseil des Arts de l'Ontario, et si je dis ça, c'est parce que j'ai été moi aussi à plusieurs reprises mon évaluateur et j'ai dénoncé les méthodes d'évaluation. 
il n'y a jamais euh, un intérêt au projet. Il y a un intérêt sur des considérations. Combien de publics vous avez touché Combien de ceci euh, C'est des indicateurs de rendement. Des... Écoutez, on transforme l'artiste en un bureaucrate, comme pas possible, on le pousse à mentir sur des éléments de réponse, alors que le projet devait être le principal. Je mets en question le CAO, je le dit de toute façon, je mets en, cons... en, 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 en cause aussi, parce qu'il y a un critère, il y a un critère qui est quand même aberrant, un critère de sélection qu'on appelle les, 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 les minorités visibles. Franchement, les minorités visibles. Ça veut dire que là, il faut être vraiment euh, se peindre et aller poser sa demande de, de subvention et, et la suivre. Vous voyez, vous voyez pas, je suis visible, regardez. Tu vois D'accord bon, Vous considérez qu'il y a une dualité linguistique et que dans, dans un cas ou dans un autre, une de ces, de ces, de ces langues serait minoritaire. C'est clair. À ce moment-là, établissez des règles en fonction de ça. N'est-ce pas alors, moi, je veux qu'on juge les projets, qu'on juge le ratio. Quand j'ai dit une demande sur quatre, ça veut dire qu'il y a des... C'est une moyenne, attention. Parce qu'il y a des articles qui en font 10, qui en font 12, que n'ont rien reçu. C'est que le problème est très grave. Le problème est très grave. Et on se cache. On se cache derrière des considérations... Je m'arrête. On se cache derrière des considérations très techniques, très technicistes et à la fois sournoises. Voilà. Ouais. Merci. Compliqué. Compliqué. Alors, final uh, speaker. Passionate. You're passionate. I don't know what the hell you said, but man, it's passionate. I won my French award in grade 8. I went on to take honors French in grade 9 and 10. And then I ran into a barrier. I don't conform very well to gender, apparently. And there's rules and lines and boxes about how one should look. Um, and, uh, and who gets called on for questions by the teacher, a male teacher, will often pick the girl that looks most like a girl. You know, who's going to give the prettiest answer seemed to be more important than the right answer. And I started to feel quite outside in my classroom experience. And I'd forgotten completely about that till I spoke at a, this is gonna screw you up, isn't it, me walking around? <laughs> Spill it. Boundaries, see? Huh? They're everywhere. <laughs> so I showed up at a high school last week. I work a lot with uh, LGBTQ youth, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, I'm just gonna say queer or trans. Um, youth, uh, particularly ones who are finding the boundaries and barriers to their existence and participation and what is at stake when they don't participate. They're finding it really tough out there. And I went to this school on uh, Wednesday and spoke to a young girl who was having a very hard time showing up at class. And, um, and it's because some kids are looking at her differently because she's come out. I mean, she's come out at 14 as a lesbian. I never came out as, I didn't even know what a lesbian was until I was 26. So, you know, language is a barrier. Like, what are, I don't even, you know, and so then, are you labeled or are you identified, you know, do you identify or are you labeled? And so the boundaries and barriers can become external or internal. And so, um, anyway, she's been brave enough to come out, not at home yet, because when she goes home from school, her dad still hears stuff on the radio and talks about fucking faggots. And that's language that excludes her a lot. And, um, So she, I don't know when that will happen, but she's not able to participate fully in school and we are losing kids because they aren't finding a place because of the boundaries and boxes and uh, conformity that is expected around uh, uh, gender presentation. So, um, so anyway, I loved your passion, but I'm mad as hell at my grade 11 teacher and all the boundaries that I started to face at that time that made me step away. Like he didn't kick me out, nothing happened like that. But people self-eject because they're not getting, and getting where they need to be. So I think that that's a lot about what's at stake when we talk about um, the barriers faced by, uh, by queer and trans youth, for sure. Um, and uh, you know, where, where we can participate. Uh, you know, part of participating is as simple as um, being able to go to the washroom. And so again, we get into this gender presentation thing because um, I, I haven't, haven't gone here yet, but I was at a school today 
uh, speaking to some uh, grade three kids about another completely different thing. They directed me to the washroom and it has a skirt on the door. Now you wouldn't be able to go, you like, you know, there's not very many women in here with skirts, and yet still the skirt is the main symbol that says this is the women's washroom. And what happens when I try to go into the women's washroom is that, um, uh, you know, because right away the assumptions that are made about who I am because my hair is short uh, excludes me from uh, full participation. And so I was uh, not long ago at Mohawk College and I was following this woman down the hall and I saw the skirt and I didn't have one on but I thought I'd try it anyway. So I was heading down, she opened the door and then turned and said, sorry, this is the ladies. <laughs> and I said, well that's why I brought my girls. <laughs> and, and, then I, you know, and then she said, oh my god, I'm so sorry, your hair is so short. <laughs> and I'm tired and I have three children and I'm in school and I'm so tired and your hair is so short and so you know so finally I got her to let me into the washroom and we could have a little conversation about that and you know these are the sorts of things these um, uh, socially constructed barriers that we all place on each other out there and then on ourselves you know how people present lots of times they don't even want to, you know, a little boy, uh, this woman from Chile, uh, she's just been here two years, her little boy had hair down to here, apparently he was like nine. He was so, you know, he loved himself. He loved everything about himself in a good, healthy way. He showed up at one of our schools in Hamilton and a kid called him gay and he came home and said, I want my hair cut. And his mother is beside herself, not because if he wanted short hair, have short hair. But he wants short hair so that he can conform to boys have short hair and then they're straight and girls have long hair and then they won't be queer. And so these are the sorts of um, boxes that I spend a lot of time trying to get people to break through um, either by not imposing them externally or freeing them yourself internally. You know, really yeah. presenting how you, how you, who you are. I didn't know I looked at, Gary Warner said once, he didn't know he was black till, he, I think this is true, I quote you all the time, so I hope it's true. He didn't know he was black until he showed up in France and somebody said, oh, you're black. Like, he came from Jamaica. Nobody was black there because everybody was just the same. But until somebody says to you, ah, you are that, you go, oh, really? And so I didn't know what I was until people started, you know, telling me I was, you know, calling me lesbo or this or that. And, um, and I didn't know I looked like a man actually like I identify fully as a woman you know just for the record but I didn't know I looked like a man until somebody said to me um, in some of the training I do um, well, you don't don't you think it would go better for you like there'd be less barriers if you would um, if you would dress like a woman and so that particular day I had you know pants and a shirt and a and another shirt, and my other shirt was from Cotton Ginny, which is a, you know, you may not all know that store, but it's a girl's <laughs> store. Like, it was a girl's shirt, but somehow I was dressed like a man, but I didn't know I looked like a man until somebody told me, and then I've been trying to figure that out since then. Like, what is it that, and so women will tell, this woman told me, I knew when I walked in the room that you were a lesbian, because your hair was short, and back to the hair thing, and so, okay, there must be more, I said, and she's like, no, no, really, um, I just always can tell, she said, I always know. And it's because, you know, the women who have short hair. So I tried to break, you know, she's an educational assistant, so I thought she would appreciate some education, but it wasn't going well. And so, you know, we were having this back and forth, and I was like really trying to press her into breaking that down a little bit more for me. And she exasperatedly said, your shoulders are broad. <laughs> Oh, okay. And now I looked at the girls' washroom again today, and it's true. We only have a skirt and no shoulders. <laughs> it's true. But if you look at the men's, like, you have quite, you know, your shoulders line up a little better. So, you know, and I'm not sure why all that is, but all of these things go to create boundaries that exclude, you know, they have excluded me from being able to understand what he said in some ways. And they have excluded me, some, and some of it's been external and some of it's been my choice because I've been too afraid to confront it. And so it's really about, the work I do around with queer kids is about helping them confront these barriers and boundaries that keep them from participating when they should have full access to everything that everybody has, whether it's marriage or school or whatever that is, right? And then, on the other hand, when I'm not doing so hot at ending homophobia, 
I decided I would end poverty. And if you're not from Hamilton, you need to know that uh, one in five people in Hamilton live in poverty. We have this big thing downtown called Cox Coliseum, a big bowl that you watch concerts in. You could fill that place five times with the number of people who live in poverty in this community. So that's a fifth of our community are not participating fully in life because of their economic marginalization. And, and you know, so there's lots of things that we're trying to do to increase their participation. One of that is to um, move from a minimum wage to a living wage because we have this problem with, uh, you know, well, just get a job. Like, if they would just get a job, they'd be out of poverty, but we only have one job for every three people who need one in this community. And then when you find it, it's at a place called Tim Hortons that pays, you know, 10 and a quarter. And even if you work full time, full year at minimum wage, you will still be below the poverty line. And so to participate, in community living, you must not be economically marginalized. And in Hamilton, you must make $14.95 an hour. That's what a living wage is in Hamilton, based on 2011. We're going to calculate it again for 2013. So these are ways that we uh, work to break down the, the barriers to people who are economically marginalized. There's another thing that's very interesting about the people who are economically marginalized right now, and that is, um, you know, so that so some of that money stuff is that you know they can't go and participate, so they have to exclude themselves from being engaged, or they can't participate to get to meetings. Some of the important things that Ines said: How are you actually able to, you know, dialogue and be a decision maker in your community? So we have tables where we've worked really hard to say people with the lived experience of poverty need to be here and have a voice, and we've worked hard on that in Hamilton to make sure that happens. Well, it happens to a certain extent. If they know how to play right at meetings, if you know, look at how great you are. You know, you know how to behave at a conference. You sit quietly. You nod sometimes politely. You look like you're interested when you're thinking about dinner. You know, <laughs> all of the things. You ask a question because you feel bad that if you know we talked and nobody asked a question and nobody cared. We all know how to behave at these sorts of things. And at meetings, we're the same way. We know we have meeting behavior. You know, that's socially constructed. You don't talk until the chair acknowledges you. I am terrible at meetings, you might guess. And, but I still get to go because economically and you know, in other ways and privilege that I have in this community, they can't kind of keep me out. But there are people that are economically marginalized who are suffering with severe mental health issues right now because of the despair that they're feeling living on $600 a month on Ontario Works. And they come to our tables and every once in a while they get kind of pissed off and they have an outburst. And then the people t come and talk to me afterwards and say, Maybe we shouldn't let Tim come to the meetings anymore. <laughs> he doesn't really know how to behave. But he's the one with the experience, and how are we going to end poverty if we don't have his voice there? Yes. So these are the sorts of boundary issues that I'm working on um, in my day-to-day uh, -day life through the different organizations I work with. Um, and, and I think that there's, um, there's one more thing about the, the trans co uh, conversation I just wanted to mention around transitioning. And that is, um, uh, you know, so for people, so I talked about sexual orientation, but for people whose gender uh, and sex don't really line up um, and, you know, want somehow to transition into the opposite sex, there's other barriers there that we have to understand. And one of them is age. In Ontario, you have to be 18 before you can begin the process. But if you have economic privilege, you can go to Thailand for $17,000 and get um, the operation there and then come back. There are lots of these sorts of rules and things that are made that we need to uh, kind of address and as we face, uh, as, we, as we look around in our heterosexual, uh, really gender conforming kind of world, I just encourage you to break out of every one of those boxes and uh, question gender. There you go. Mm -hmm. That's my Everyone has had the privilege of at least one question, so any question? Uh, Have you identified the people living in poverty in Hamilton? Do they belong to your soon? Yes, 52%. 52% are newcomers. That means they're here less than five years. 44% are Aboriginal people. 47% um, of our single people in Hamilton, unattached adults, 47% of unattached people live below the poverty line, and so that's, I think, uh, around 24%. So, and, uh, and children, uh, one in four children live in poverty in Hamilton. Yeah. Uh, what is the percentage of people that vote in Hamilton? You mean the, the white men? Vote. 
the cast a vote for the during elections. Yeah. It, it lines up with that same uh, thing, don't you think? Yeah. yeah. So it's low. It's low, absolutely. You know, voter turnout is, you know, that kind of participation is always something that we're looking at trying to get people engaged in that process. But how do you get somebody excited to engage in a process that continues to slap them in the face? Yeah. What was that? Um, yeah, I was, two things I was wanting to ask in is uh, what immigrant women center, what kind of programs you have to uh, help immigrant and refugee women <coughs> to overcome these obstacles. And also, another thing I want to mention is that artists tend to be also uh, poor, uh, the immigrant artists. So they also are often invited to uh, perform for charity. And I think it's very important to uh, to, uh, to pay them, to give them an area, uh, because not take them for granted. So this is the point I wanted to make, not to invite them to perform for free, basically. And uh, uh, yeah, and in this case. Well, everything we do is, uh, is towards integration of new Canadians, right? So from language instruction and everything else. But uh, uh, I was uh, reflecting on this today, and I said everything we do, we, we, we uh, practically, um, we only utilize it to get to the real issues of, of what Canadians' uh, marginalization can become. So uh, there is a lot of things written in this contract with the funders, but we always uh, you know, analyze gender, analyze uh, poverty, I analyze uh, social exclusion, and analyze uh, how people can become more participants. So there are leadership programs, and uh, we are working with boys now uh, to, for them to understand um, uh, violence and why their mothers have become victims of violence. And, uh, and what is their responsibility when they grow up? Self-respect, respect to others, and why? So, you know, all that stuff is, is, is not written in any contract, but, but that, that, and that's the, the part that is uh, at times very sad because uh, there's a lot of in, uh, uh, funding in, um, invested in integration. Yeah. A lot of money, but we are not integrated. <coughs> it's, we are not integrated. From this moment, I will, you know, go into my community and I will watch. I, I am. I bought ticket for a play in Spanish. Yeah. Right, because yes. that's my level of comfort, and it's where I am accepted. I'm not being judged by my accent, and I have my friends. So you know, we create subcultures and subgroups and subgroups, and the country is uh, is, is form of all the people. Um, not until we began to break those barriers and be accepted. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 you know, in the same table that uh, Deirdre was uh, uh, describing, uh, the poverty reduction table, every time I speak, my accent goes first and hit the brain of the participants, <laughs> right? <laughs> so for them, it's harder to decode so they are more concerned about how I sound and the, how I select the words than what I really mean. So then they say thank you and move on. So and in, in a few more uh, participants, you know, and a few more points other people make, I swear to God, yeah. it's exactly the same that I was making. Yeah. I was not acknowledged. They were too busy. Their brains were too busy. And they want diversity, right? Yeah. Everybody just struggle with their training for diversity. Your accent, my hair. But my hair. <laughs> <laughs> right up. So I, we are becoming, and I am studying theater now. I want to be a performer. So maybe I will, you know, grab that attention that is theater. You know, yeah. So, yeah. What I, I want okay. to uh, highlight. You know, at least she said she bought the ticket to go and see it here. And many, many uh, newcomers in the first five to ten years, they don't have that privilege. Uh, you know, culture, accessing participation in cultural life of the society, it comes when you ha when you all have well of, of economy uh, well established. So um, therefore, uh, hundreds of or thousands of uh, immigrants, they don't have that privilege to go to any concerts or any theater or show or exhibition. This is one point. The second point that I forgot to uh, just mention, it's not encouraged 
by the government as well. So in, in the tele television, in social media, in, in the news, you don't see that much that you see in European, Middle East, Africa, and other countries. The government itself, it comes as a, a propagandist for the culture. When you go to Europe, for example, you know, I left in uh, Europe 10 years as a refugee. But you know, being a refugee, I had the privilege of learning new culture and taking my kids to an exhibition, to a museum, to theater, and pay money in, in appreciation of that uh, beautiful artwork or whatever you know we saw and we bought. We were a refugee, we didn't have, when I came to Canada, I had only one luggage. But you know what? I, I brought what I bought in Europe because it is the culture that I brought here. And this one, you don't see it here. Uh, for example, you know, our organization last year, this year, we organized Hamilton Art Market. We brought local artists and we brought uh, newcomer artists. 65 of them, they came. Every Saturday, they showcased, they wanted to save their artwork. Money, they didn't sell in 11 weeks, nothing. No. Nothing. And, and the prices for the um, artwork was $20. $15, $40, amazing, amazing artwork. Different style that no one takes in, in university here. So what I'm saying here, we, we, we need to participate, all of us, you know, all of us, to, to take our kids, our children, our grandchildren, and make this part of culture. If, if we don't do it, government, uh, they are cutting funding. First, when it comes to cutting uh, funding, it goes to the culture component because it's privileged. Mostly when it comes to the newcomers mm -hmm. and immigrants. And after, you know, because we need them to participate in employment and other social aspects, we give to supplement some portion of mine. So therefore, I believe, you know, the, the um, community participation brings different culture, impacts in our culture and daily life. So that's why um, it's important each individual to participate. So I think that that's, uh, that's our, our keynote uh, is the theme of participation. I think all of the organizations that we have around the table are organizations that, that try to enable the participation and the integration of everyone into the society so that people can be truly equal members of the society. Mm -hmm. So that's what we work for, liberty and equality. <laughs> so thank you.